Chapter Ten of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter Ten. The Observers of the Moon. Barbicane had evidently hit upon the only plausible reason of this deviation, however slight it may have been. It had sufficed to modify the course of the projectile. It was a fatality. The bold attempt had miscarried by a fortuitous circumstance, and unless by some exceptional event, they could now never reach the moon's disk. Would they pass near enough to be able to solve certain physical and geological questions until then insoluble? This was the question. And the only one which occupied the minds of these bold travellers, as to the fate in store for themselves, they did not even dream of it. But what would become of them amid these infinite solitudes? These who would soon want air, a few more days, and they would fall stifled in this wandering projectile. But some days to these intrepid fellows was a century, and they devoted all their time to observe. That moon, which they no longer hoped to reach, the distance which had then separated the projectile from the satellite was estimated at about two hundred leagues. Under these conditions, as regards the visibility of the details of the disk, the travellers were further from the moon than are the inhabitants of the earth with their powerful telescopes. Indeed. We know that the instrument mounted by Lord Ross at Parsonstown, which magnifies six thousand five hundred times, brings the moon to within apparent distance of sixteen leagues. And more than that, with the powerful one set up at Long's Peak, the orb of night magnified forty-eight thousand times is brought to within less than two leagues, and objects having a diameter of thirty feet are seen very distinctly. So that at this distance, the topographical details of the moon, observed without glasses, could not be determined with precision. The eye caught the vast outline of those immense depressions, inappropriately called seas, but they could not recognize their nature. The prominence of the mountains disappeared under the splendid irradiation produced by the reflection of the solar rays. The eye, dazzled as if it was leaning over a bath of molten silver. Turned from it involuntarily, but the oblong form of the orb was quite clear. It appeared like a gigantic egg, with the small end turned toward the earth. Indeed, the moon, liquid and pliable in the first days of its formation, was originally a perfect sphere, but being soon drawn within the attraction of the earth, it became elongated under the influence of gravitation. In becoming a satellite, she lost her native purity of form. Her center of gravity was in advance of the center of her figure, and from this fact some savants draw the conclusion that the air and water had taken refuge on the opposite surface of the moon, which is never seen from the earth. This alteration in the primitive form of the satellite was only perceptible for a few moments. The distance of the projectile from the moon diminished very rapidly under its speed, though that was much less. Than its initial velocity, but eight or nine times greater than that which propels our express trains. The oblique course of the projectile, from its very obliquity, gave Michel Ardan some hopes of striking the lunar disk at some point or other. He could not think that they would never reach it. No, he could not believe it, and this opinion he often repeated. But Barbicane, who was a better judge, always answered him with merciless logic. No, Michel. No, we can only reach the moon by a fall, and we are not falling. The centripetal force keeps us under the moon's influence, but the centrifugal force draws us irresistibly away from it. This was said in a tone which quenched Michel Ardan's last hope. The portion of the moon which the projectile was nearing was the northern hemisphere. That which the selenographic maps place below, for these maps are generally drawn after the outline given by the glasses, and we know that they reverse the objects. Such 
was the Mappa Selenographica of Boer and Modler, which Barbicane consulted. This northern hemisphere presented vast plains, dotted with isolated mountains. At midnight the moon was full. At that precise moment the travellers should have alighted upon it, if the mischievous meteor had not diverted the course. The orb was exactly in the condition determined by the Cambridge Observatory. It was mathematically at its perigree, and at the zenith of the twenty-eighth parallel. An observer, placed at the bottom of the enormous Columbiad, pointed perpendicularly to the horizon, would have framed the moon in the mouth of the gun. A straight line drawn through the axis of the piece would have passed through the centre of the orb of night. It is needless to say that during the night of the 5th to 6th of December the travellers took not an instant's rest. Could they close their eyes when so near this new world? No. All their feelings were concentrated in one single thought. See, representatives of the earth, of humanity past and present, all centred in them. It is through their eyes that the human race look at these lunar regions, and penetrate the secrets of their satellite. A strange motion filled their hearts as they went from one window to the other. Their observations, reproduced by Barbicane, were rigidly determined. To take them they had glasses, to correct them maps. As regards the optical instruments at their disposal, they had excellent marine glasses, specifically constructed for this journey. They possessed magnifying powers of one hundred. They would thus have brought the moon to within a distance, apparent, of less than two thousand leagues from the earth. But then, at a distance which for three hours in the morning did not exceed sixty-five miles, and in a medium free from all atmospheric disturbances, these instruments could reduce the lunar surface to within less than one thousand five hundred yards. End of chapter ten.